Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just before we start, I want to remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available for viewing via a link which will be emailed to you. So keep in mind if you're experiencing any problems with the audio. Uh, we welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, you can type them into the chat menu at any time, but these will not be addressed until the end of the presentation. If I am unable to answer your questions immediately, rest assured that I will find the answers and get back to you as soon as possible. So welcome to Goodbye Water Hammer, Hello Pump Protection. My name is John Anderson. I am the Regional Sales Manager for Western Canada for Triangle Fluid Controls, and I am pleased to be your host for this afternoon's webinar. So today, folks, we're going to talk about check valves in general, and specifically, we're going to talk about non-slam check valves. So I'm going to start off with a, a check valve overview featuring um, little bits of information about swing check and double door type check valves and how they compare with non-slam check valves. Uh, we're going to be talking about check valves and their relation to flow. We're going to talk about some ideas around sizing check valves. Uh, some ideas around reverse flow and water hammer. And we're also going to take a good overview of DFT non-slam check valve models. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to uh, give you some examples of uh, check valves, non-slam check valves at work in the field. And I'll give you a, an engineered example of uh, non-slam check valves uh, applied in the field as well. So let's get underway. So you can see on your screen a cutaway of a, a swing check type valve. Uh, I'll use this for comparative purposes because um, swing checks are ubiquitous. I would venture to say that they take up about oh, 90 percent of uh, check valves applied in general process industry. So the basic purpose of check valves is to allow flow to go one way and prevent it from uh, flowing back the other way. Uh, interestingly enough, this, uh, this technology is about 2,000 years old. As the, the Romans used leather flappers to control the flow of water they were bringing in from the Tigris River. Not one type of check valve cover off all applications. Uh, I think you may be surprised to learn the number of people I come across in my daily and monthly dealings of people that think that... Uh, a swing check would cover off every check valve application out there. And I'm pretty confident uh, to, um, to think that by the end of this presentation, you'll, uh, you'll agree with me. So check valves, as you can see again by the cutaway on the screen, should always be in the fully open position, of course, unless they're acting like a check valve and preventing reverse flow, which means that the disc should always be at the, uh, at the travel stop you can see on the inside of the body of the check valve. And check valves, regardless uh, uh, of type, whether they're swing checks, double doors, or non-slam check valves, should not be fluttering or chattering. If check valves are chattering, it, uh, it puts a lot of undue mechanical wear and tear on them, and they'll wear out long before their time. And check valves should be sized for the application, not the pipe size. So let's talk a little bit about uh, flow and check valves. Uh, oftentimes, uh, designers will uh, simply choose a check valve for the line size. So as an example, if you have a six inch class 150 line, a designer or a maintenance person might specify a six inch class 150 check valve without any consideration for what the flow is. So you wanna make sure that you're generating enough flow so that that check valve is in the fully open position. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but generally you should be looking at generating about two meters per second in order to keep a check valve in the fully open or stable position. And again, if the check valve is not stable, uh, it could be chattering and that puts a lot of undue mechanical wear and tear on the check valve and it can wear out long before its time. Check valves should be sized for the application. So regardless of the type or style of check valve, the longest trouble-free service will come from uh, valves that are sized for the application, not the line size, whereby the disc is stable against the internal stop and in the fully open position. 
size matters. So a properly sized check valve will help to make a piping system reliable. It increases the lifespan of the system. Uh, by having the check valve sized properly, it eliminates disc fluttering or chattering, which contributes to the overall cost savings of a uh, piping system. So if check valves are in a stable, fully open position and again are not chattering, then they, uh, they don't need to be replaced before their time, which would entail a uh, shutting down of a process, having a pipe fitter go out, take an old check valve out, put a new check valve in, which obviously uh, would lead to undue cost. So unlike uh, ball valves or, or gate valves, check valves are self-acting, meaning there's no outside means for turning them off and on. And they are flow sensitive, so they rely on the line fluid to make them work or open and close. Um, it, it's, it's been my experience that check valves are often overlooked pieces of equipment in, uh, in piping systems. So if you think of check valves as flow actuated control valves, it actually puts a little bit more of an important spin on the oft overlooked check valve. And most check valves are designed for horizontal installation only. That isn't the case with DFT non-slam check valves as they can be installed in uh, horizontal, vertical up or vertical down orientation. And you could imagine for a moment a, a swing check installed in a vertical down position with the uh, flapper just hanging in the open position. Certainly uh, not very practical. So again, here we have a, a, a cutaway of a swing check. Uh, you can see it's a pretty simple design. Um, it features a high CV, so when that disc, uh, disc is in the open position, it's pretty much out of the flow path, which, uh, which leads to a, uh, to a high CV. For those of you who may not know what the term CV refers to, that is essentially the flow capacity of a valve. Uh, swing checks are relatively easy to repair, and most of them are ASME B16.10 face-to-face, -face, which is the, uh, the standard face-to-face -face dimension for most flanged valves. So on just about every pump out there, there is some kind of a check valve. And the check valve is there to prevent backflow from getting past the check valve, potentially damaging the uh, pump by spinning the impeller the wrong way. Uh, swing checks and double door type check valves are perfectly applicable on pump discharge in what I call light duty applications, meaning that the pump's not cycling very often, uh, not a large volume of uh, media going through, let's say water for the case of our discussion. But there are some scenarios where you have an inordinate amount of head coming back onto the pump, meaning that there are some reverse flow and water hammer issues that, uh, that can occur. And when those scenarios come up, you really should consider the use of a non-slam check valve. Um, one scenario is uh, it's often a, an operating uh, plant will draw its water from a local lake or river, and you have a pump house pumping the uh, water up to the facility, sometimes straight up. So you could imagine in that case, if the pump tripped, you had a lot of head coming back onto the pump. Uh, if you have two or more pumps in parallel, uh, dumping into a common header and one pump trips, it puts a lot of uh, uh, back pressure on the other pump or pumps. You have a lot of head coming back onto the pumps. And in that case, a, a non-slam check valve may be indicated. Uh, the third and most common scenario is when a phenomenon called column separation arises. So that's when you have a, a pump on, uh, on grade. Uh, the pump is busy, meaning it's cycling often, and there's a considerable amount of volume going through the pump. Uh, uh, again, let's, let's assume that we're talking about water for the sake of our discussion. If a swing check, uh, or to a lesser degree, which we'll talk about in a few slides, a double door type check valve were to have been misapplied in a situation where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem, a, a couple of things can occur. Um, so it, um, 
if the uh, pumps uh, happily pumping along and let's say the pump trips due to a power failure that column of water will continue down the line until it separates from the pump as indicated by that term column separation and when that occurs it's akin to taking a, an elastic band and stretching it. So if I had an elastic band between my two hands and I stretched it out and I let one end go, it would come snapping back toward my other hand. The same thing can occur with that column of water. So it comes snapping back toward the pump. And if a swing check or a double door type check valve were to have been misapplied in that situation, uh, a swing check doesn't close quickly enough to prevent the backflow from getting past the check valve, potentially damaging the pump by spinning the impeller the wrong way. And when the swing check finally closes, it slams shut, and whatever backflow is behind that disc hits the disc. The energy has to dissipate somehow, and it does so in the form of water hammer. Now, folks, that occurs because a swing check and a double door type check valve require backflow for them to operate. A non-slam check valve, and you're going to see in a couple of slides what I, uh, uh, a good illustration of this, but a non-slam check valve does not require backflow for it to close. So it has a disc with a spring behind it. Flow pushes the disc open. As soon as the flow velocity starts to slow down, the spring starts to push the disc back towards the seat, and a non-slam check valve is designed to be closed just before you reach zero flow. Because it's closed just before you reach zero flow, it, uh, it, it eliminates that backflow and, uh, and the resulting water hammer that can occur by the misapplication of a swing check or a double door. And I think this next slide will help to make that a li little clearer. So here is a, a, a typical curve showing a flow velocity slowing down to zero. And you can see, so here we are at zero. And you can see a yellow line right here. Uh, folks, that's typically where a swing check valve would close. So again, if we had a swing check valve on the discharge of a pump that was light duty, meaning that uh, it's, it's not cycling often, not a lot of volume of water going through, uh, you could tolerate this little bit of backflow. However, if we're in a situation where an inordinate amount of head is coming back onto the pump, for example, when we have that column separation phenomenon, you want a check valve that's closed just before zero flow because that's going to eliminate the backflow, which in turn eliminates um, the uh, water hammer that can result again from the misapplication of a swing check or a double door type check valve. So here we have a, a, a double door check valve. Now, this is a little better in terms of closing speed, folks, because uh, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but there's a coiled spring here with two cantilevered arms coming off that coiled spring. Those arms assist these doors in closing a little more quickly, but study after study has indicated that double door type check valves still don't provide good pump protection and guard against water hammer in situations where we have reverse flow and water hammer and in turn lots of head coming back toward the pump. If a, um, if a, a double door type check valve sees a couple of slamming incidents, it's possible for one or both uh, of these cantilevered arms to break off, and it's also possible for um, bits of the uh, of the corners of the doors to break off and go downstream. So now you've got bits of metal going downstream, potentially damaging uh, whatever components are downstream of the check valve, and you're left with uh, with a check valve that that is not operating properly. And I'm just going to go back to the uh, swing check for a moment. Uh, if a swing check, again, is misapplied on the discharge of a pump where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem, and it sees some slamming incidents, it's possible for this hinge pin to crack and break off. And again, now you've got bits of metal traveling downstream, and you have a nothing but a spool piece left on the discharge of the pump. Um, in several instances, I've heard uh, uh, maintenance people tell me, say, you know, John, 
couple of months ago, I picked up the disc from a, uh, from a swing check in my sump. What's going on? Well, that's exactly what's going on. On the discharge of their sump pump, they had a swing check misapplied. It had seen several slamming incidents. This hinge pin cracks, and you end up with the whole disc downstream of the pump. So uh, really important to make sure that you use a non-slam check valve in those situations where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem. So with DFT inline check valves, you have a disc that travels in line with the flow. Due to spring assist and short travel, by the time the forward flow velocity has decreased to zero, the valve disc has closed, and uh, the valve disc has reached the seat, and the valve is already closed. DFT check valves also have the ability to be custom sized for low or intermittently low flow conditions, all in an effort to make sure that the, um, uh, that the check valve is in the fully open position and not chattering, even under low flow conditions. So how we're able to do that is uh, some models of DFT check valves are designed so that the disc travels a quarter inch per inch of line size. So if I had a, a two inch uh, sample of a check valve, by simple arithmetic, you can deduce that that disc would have to travel a half an inch from being closed to fully open. Um, and we can apply the same arithmetic to a 10 inch valve, the disc would travel two and a half inches. An eight inch valve, two inches. If we had a one inch valve, uh, um, sorry, if we had a four inch valve, the disc would travel one inch. So this is kind of a simple example of how, we, uh, how we're able to custom size these valves. And I say a simple example because the engineering department at DFT has a, uh, an ISA-based uh, sizing program, uh, which they take your uh, flow parameters, input them, and uh, it gives you a lot of information, which we'll talk about in a second. So I'm just going to go up here to the... Uh, this is a, a, an illustration of um, one of the models of DFT non-slam check valves. So this happens to be actually a, a, a two inch valve. And so again, this disc is going to travel a half an inch between being closed and fully open. So we know that uh, it's rare for a, uh, um, a, a fluid line to be um, at full flow. So let's just uh, imagine for a moment that we have a, a 10 inch valve or a, a 10 inch line and the highest the flow ever gets in that 10 inch line is uh, most most closely resembles full flow in a four inch line. So what we would do in that uh, situation is to restrict the travel of the disc from uh, from um, four, uh, four inches like we would have in a 10 inch valve to uh, to one inch, which would uh, most closely resemble um, a full flow in a, in a four inch line. So essentially fooling the check valve into, into thinking that it's a, a four inch valve, even though we have a 10 inch spool piece, all in an effort to make sure that that check valve is in the fully open position uh, under low flow conditions. So DFT check valves are designed to prevent water hammer. And you're going to see in, in, uh, in a few slides, they don't completely prevent water hammer. So we're not talking about flat curves here as far as, uh, as, far as the, uh, uh, the, the generation of, of pressure waves. We're, uh, we're talking about um, uh, it, it mitigates the effects of water hammer to the point where it's negligible. Uh, generally speaking, DFT check valves crack at a half a PSI differential pressure and are at maximum flow at one PSI differential pressure. Um, as I've mentioned before, DFT check valves can be installed in any position, horizontal, vertical up, or vertical down. It mentions with modification because it, once we get up to a bore size of about say eight or 10 inch, depending on the model, it's possible that the weight of the disc could overcome the stiffness of the spring. In that case, we have springs available that are two or three pound springs, meaning that they require two or three pound differential pressure for them to open. Those springs are a little stiffer and they will uh, uh, overcome the, the weight of the disc, making sure that the, the check valve is closed, even though it's in a vertical down position. 
Uh, on the other end, if you have uh, applications that require a light cracking pressure, uh, DFT check valves uh, are available with springs as light as a tenth of a PSI. So DFT check valves are so-called center guided, meaning that, and I'm just going to flip here uh, forward, center guided, meaning that we have a stem right in the center of the disc. In smaller bore check valves, uh, half inch through three inch, uh, the check valve is so-called body guided, meaning the outside diameter of the disc is guided by the inside diameter of the body. Several models of DFT check valves are also so-called dual guided. And I think you can see in the illustration here, we have a, a stem upstream and downstream of the disc, meaning that the disc is held in place on either side of the disc. Now, folks, that's, that's, uh, that, that's important to consider because good engineering practice dictates that check valves should be installed five to 10 pipe diameters downstream from the discharge of the pump. And that's, uh, that's a good rule of thumb to follow because at that point, flow is becoming laminar and check valves as well as other components tend to operate better in laminar flow than they do in, um, in turbulent flow. However, it's not always possible to get that five to 10 pipe diameters downstream from the discharge of the pump, uh, mostly due to physical space restrictions. So in, in fact, I've seen situations where DFT check valves are mounted right on to the discharge of the pump. And what that means for the check valve is that the disc here would constantly see, oh, sorry. The disc here would constantly see more pressure on one side of the disc than the other. So I think you can see that mechanically speaking, um, because some of our competitors in the non-slam check valve world feature a design that utilizes a single guided disc, so a stem just downstream from the disc. So mechanically speaking, I think you can see that um, a, a, a situation where you're inside the 5 to 10 pipe diameters, the flow is turbulent, the disc is seeing more pressure on one side than the other constantly, that mechanically a dual guided disc system would stand up better in that application than a, uh, a design that features a single guided disc. Now we talked about custom sizing, uh, whereby we can, uh, we can custom size these check valves for uh, low or intermittently low flow conditions. I mentioned that uh, DFT engineering has a, an ISA based sizing program where we take your flow parameters, input it into the program and with a push of a button, it will tell us that um, no, actually the check valve that you're considering using will work off the shelf for your, low, for your flow conditions, uh, meaning that there's enough flow to create enough lift so that the check valve is in the fully open position and is stable or it will tell us, no, we need to custom size that, uh, that check valve. And we do so by installing a travel stop just underneath the spring here, restricting the travel of the disc, all in an effort to make sure that that check valve is in the fully open position. And that uh, sizing program will give us such information as uh, the, uh, the exact dimension of the travel stop to be installed, uh, the adjusted CV of the valve, and also the pressure drop across the valve for your particular flow conditions. Now, the, uh, the default configuration for DFT check valves is a metal-to-metal -metal seat, but if you require bubble-tight closure, we have plenty of soft seat options available. Uh, of course, pressure, temperature, and media dependent. Uh, the, the default material for most DFT check valves is a WCB or carbon steel body with 316 stainless steel trim and a, a 316 stainless uh, spring. Uh, in Alberta, where I come from, the vast majority of, uh, of valves that we sell feature a, an Inconel spring just in case there's uh, trace H2S considerations. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, we offer uh, check valves in a variety of alloys, so uh, full stainless, uh, low temp alloys. In, in the mining business, we'd off offered full Manel or titanium valves. So essentially, any alloy that's machinable, we can build these, uh, these check valves from. 
So DFT check valves are critical service problem solving application type check valves. So we're, we're not in the business of trying to uh, take over the check valve world in that we're trying to replace every swing check or every double door check valve that's in service in, in, uh, in, in process applications around the world. Swing checks and double door type check valves are perfectly fine pieces of, of equipment. The problem comes up is when they're misapplied on the discharge of pumps where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem. So DFT inline check valves prevent water hammer. And again, you're going to see in a few slides, we're not talking about completely flat curves, but they mitigate water hammer to the point where it's negligible. Uh, they guard against reverse flow protection by being closed just before you reach zero flow, uh, which in turn protects pumps from spinning backwards because it prevents backflow from getting past the check valve, uh, which also prevents parts from going downstream, which occurs if you misapply a swing check or a double door on pump discharge where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem. Uh, those check valves see slamming incidents, and as I've already described, it's possible for bits to break off and go downstream, potentially damaging components downstream of the check valve. If the check valve is properly sized, I've already mentioned that sometimes custom sizing is required to keep the check valve in the fully open position under low flow conditions, or if a check valve uh, is going to work for your flow conditions off the shelf. So if a, if a valve is uh, sized properly for the application, long life is typically uh, assured. Uh, I know of several instances where DFT check valves have been in service for 20 years or more with the same internals as they started with. Um, due to the ability of DFT check valves to be, uh, to be custom sized, they've been nicknamed the control valve of check valves. So let's talk a little bit now about uh, some of the, uh, or all of the DFT check valves that are available. Here we have the DFT Excalibur, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, um, a raised face flange connection, split bolted body design that is ASME B16.10 face to face. So again, that's the, uh, the standard face to face dimension for most flanged valves. So if you were to have a flange swing check misapplied on pump discharge where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem and you wanted to replace it with a non-slam check valve, uh, a DFT Excalibur would be a good choice because you could uh, slip that in without having to make any piping changes. This valve is avail available in flanged or butt weld ends and it indicates that the valve is available 2 through 24 inch. Uh, which is indicated in the catalog. Uh, you would see an asterisk in the catalog that uh, that directs you to contact the factory if you uh, require larger bore check valves than 24 inch. Uh, incidentally, DFT have the ability to turn castings up to 54 inch in, uh, in, in uh, bore size. A typical application for the DFT Excalibur, it's a popular valve for the discharge of high pressure boiler feed water pumps as an example. Um, that occurs typically in the, uh, in the oil and gas business in uh, SAG-D operations, which stands for Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage. Uh, the uh, boiler feed water discharge is a very critical service. If those pumps go down, uh, the entire operation will go down. So um, those end users are highly dependent on DFT Excalibur check valves. Uh, another typical application is on the discharge of lean amine booster pumps in a refinery, as an example. If they lose their lean amine, uh, the hydro treaters in a refinery go down, and if the hydro treaters go down, the entire refinery will go down. So again, just a, a good illustration of uh, how critical a service uh, these check valves are applied on. Uh, the next model we're featuring here is a DFT uh, G model GLC. It's also a raised face uh, flange connection, but is a ANSI short pattern, mean, meaning it has a short face-to-face, -face, short in comparison to ASME B16.10 face-to-face. Um, for that reason, uh, this model is favored in new installations where people can design around the, uh, uh, the short pattern of the check valve. Uh, it's available 1 through 24 inch, 
again, uh, DFT has the ability to turn larger castings than 24 inch um, available in anti-class 150 through 1500. Uh, and again, um, available in uh, WCB body, full full stainless steel, and uh, uh, other alloys, as I've mentioned before. Uh, 316 stainless steel trim, raised face, RTJ ends, and as you can see, it's a unibody valve. Kind of looks like a globe valve from the outside. Typical application for a GLC, it, also a popular valve for the discharge of uh, high-pressure boiler feed water pumps, as an example. That brings us to the model PDC. Folks, this is a, uh, a valve that's designed specifically for reciprocating compressors. So you would never ever consider the use of this valve on a liquid application. PDC stands for Pulse Dampened Chamber. And the, the uh, Pulse Dampened Chamber comes from some additional apparatus to this valve above and beyond a typical non-slam check valve. So you can see here, we have a spring with a disc that operates in the same manner as the, the other models. But additionally, we have an annulus that runs through this valve, and you can see a small ball check here. The ball check and the annulus operate in concert to equalize the body cavity pressure so that this check valve will not chatter between strokes of a compressor. So if, uh, if I were able to show you a full working model of a PDC and we open the disc and, uh, and uh, let it go, meaning to, to shut it, um, unlike other DFT check valve models that snap shut immediately when you let go of the disc, this one would slowly find its seat, slowly meaning about a second to a second and a half, and you could hear air bleed off through the annulus downstream. Again, that annulus and ball check operate in concert to equalize the body cavity pressure so that this valve doesn't chatter between strokes of the compressor. Uh, incidentally, folks, if you go to YouTube and, uh, and just search DFT check valves, you'll find uh, a number of really good uh, animations of the operation of DFT check valves, including the PDC here. So if it's a little unclear about how this valve operates, I, I urge you to do that. And uh, I think the animation that's, uh, that's posted on YouTube there will, will make that clear to you. If it doesn't, feel free to uh, email me. Uh, the next model we'll take a look at is the WLC, Wafer Lift Check. Obviously, this is a wafer style valve, meaning it would be sandwiched between two flanges, gasket on either face, uh, meaning the and, and the bolting is external uh, on this valve. Uh, API 594 is the standard face-to-face -face dimension for uh, most wafer style valves. And the WLC here uh, only conforms to API 594 in class 600 and above. That's because in the lower pressure classes, class 150 and 300, uh, we needed extra width to accommodate the dual guided disc. And I mentioned already the importance of a dual guided disc, particularly when you have a, a check valve installed in turbulent flow, which is inside the five to 10 pipe diameters downstream from the discharge of the pump. So, you know, important for us to have that dual guided disc in this uh, in this valve. Uh, this valve is ideal for pump discharge. A, a, a good example is the discharge of produced water pumps. Next, we have a, um, a another wafer style valve. This is the TLW tapped lug wafer. Really important feature about this valve, ladies and gentlemen, is that the bolts are not exposed, but we still have a wafer style valve. Uh, there are several facilities out there that do not like to have uh, exposed bolts. Um, so if they want to use or utilize a wafer style valve, this is an excellent choice. Uh, API 594 face to face throughout its entire range. Um, it is a single guided disc, so as I mentioned before, um, I would only recommend the use of this valve if you can achieve the 5 to 10 pipe diameters downstream from the discharge of the pump. Um, a raised face, uh, wafer ends, available 2 through 24 inch, and as I've already mentioned, there are no exposed, exposed bolts, uh, but at the same time, we offer a wafer style valve in this model. 
Another wafer style uh, model that we offer is the DFT ALC, uh, available 2 through 24 inch throughout its entire range. Also, API 594 face to face dimension throughout its entire range. So, again, uh, we have a valve here that features a single guided disc only. Again, would only recommend the use of this valve if we can achieve the 5 to 10 pipe diameters downstream from the discharge of the pump. Uh, as you can see here, available in class 150 and 300. That brings us to the DFT basic check. Interestingly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this check valve is very, very similar to the original design of non-slam check valves brought about by the Americans during the Second World War in the 1940s when they were looking for a fast-acting check valve. Incidentally, DFT have been building non-slam check valves for more than 70 years. So the basic check available a uh, quarter inch through an inch and a half. You can see a, uh, the pipe thread in the back and a larger thread up front. This is designed to thread into a reducing coupling or an elbow, essentially making that the body of the check valve. Uh, this valve features full stainless steel construction. Uh, by far and away, the largest application for the basic check is on the gas annulus of wellheads, where we're trying to keep uh, gas from backing up into the production well on a wellhead. Uh, they love this uh, basic check style because it can be installed in a multitude of positions and doesn't freeze up in the wintertime as swing checks are wont to do. Next, another small bore check valve is the DFT SCV. And this is a great example, a good illustration of a body guided disc. So in other words, as I've mentioned before, the outside diameter of this uh, valve is guided by the inside diameter of the body. This valve is available uh, in pressure class 750 through 3600 CWP or cold working pressure, equivalent to PSI, but downrated for temperature. It's available in uh, threaded or socket welded ends. It's a full stainless steel construction, features an ink and L spring or X750 and uh, complies with NACE MRO, uh, MRO 175. Uh, popular application for these valves, small condensate return lines, boiler feed water lines, and, uh, and another kind of off non-slam uh, um, application, a very popular valve for systems that operate on low pressure fuel gas. They love this valve because it features a very light cracking pressure, uh, which allows the gas to go by and prevents fuel gas from backing up into the system. Here we have a DFT vacuum breaker, ladies and gentlemen. It is configured in the opposite manner of a non-slam check valve. So a non-slam check valve would have a disc with a spring behind it. Flow pushes the spring open. In this case, it's going to be used as a vacuum breaker. So let's imagine for a moment if we had a vessel uh, with a pipe piece or a pup piece coming off of it going to atmosphere, a vacuum breaker would be ins installed on the top of the uh, of the pup piece. If the uh, if the vessel went into vacuum, instead of uh, uh, fluid flow pushing the disc open, uh, vacuum would suck the disc uh, suck the valve open, allowing atmospheric pressure to come in to keep the vessel from collapsing. Uh, it's also applicable not only on pressure vessels, but tanks and uh, to uh, prevent uh, line pipe from collapsing. Uh, incidentally, a couple of other models, particularly the WLC, can also be used as a vacuum breaker and would be installed in the, in the reverse direction. Uh, then you would install the valve to be used as a non-slam check valve. And that brings us to uh, last but not least, but the DFT Y caliber. I think you can see why it's aptly called the Y caliber. It is a Y pattern, non-slam check valve that features a pressure seal bonnet and is also inline repairable. Uh, it's available four through 14 inch in class 600 to class 2500. Butt weld ends can be installed horizontally or vertically. 
typical applications for this check valve, uh, again, in uh, uh, high pressure, uh, uh, high pressure um, applications in the power industry, where we have a lot of class 1500 applications and above. Uh, it, it's also utilized in the oil and gas industry on the discharge of high pressure boiler feed water pumps, also used on the discharge of DEA, or again, uh, lean amine booster pumps, again, very critical service applications where end users are very dependent on this check valve and uh, expect them to uh, operate properly over a long period of time. So let's talk about water hammer and this is the or at least one of the dictionary definitions of water hammer. The generation and effect of high pressure shock waves or transients and column separations, as I've mentioned before, this is where we earn our money, in relatively incompressible fluids such as water when it is stopped abruptly by an object such as a valve disc. So incompressible fluid is really the crux of why water hammer can be so damaging to piping systems. So imagine, if you will, if I had a pipe in my hand and it was filled with water to the point where you couldn't compress it anymore. So that means if I tried to stuff in one molecule of water on one side, another molecule of water on the other end would have to be displaced. That means, again, that you cannot compress that water anymore. So imagine for a moment a slug of compressed water traveling down a pipeline at a high velocity and let's say a gate valve from, from an emergency shutoff valve were to be uh, suddenly introduced to the pipeline. Uh, the water hits that gate because it's compressed to the point where it can't be compressed any longer uh, or anymore I should say. The energy would have to, have to dissipate somehow and it would do so in the form of water hammer. The, uh, some of the symptoms of water hammer include noise, vibration, ruptured piping, and equipment damage. All because water hammer takes uh, the uh, rated pressure of a system far beyond its rating. So, although the check, uh, although the uh, the check valve takes the brunt of the punishment in a in a water hammer situation, again because of the misapplication of a swing check or a double door check valve on the discharge of a pump where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem. Those pressure surges radiate out to all of the other components within that closed loop system. So you're running the risk of damage to other system components such as pressure, temperature controls, expansion joints, control valves, pipe racks and alike. So really, really important to consider the use of a non-slam check valve and eliminate those pressure spikes from your system. Uh, here we have some examples of some of the uh, pressures that can be generated due to water hammer incidents. Now this example is based on 25 feet per second velocity, which is smoking hot. Uh, however, it's all relative. So in a class 150 system based on, on this, uh, you could generate up to 1735 PSI with a um, uh, with a water hammer incident. In a class 300 system, 2170. In a class uh, 600 system, 2950 PSI. Obviously, well beyond the design pressure rating for a particular closed loop piping system. Now you can see a graph at the bottom here, a unitless graph, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, pressure spikes uh, that can be generated through the use of a conventional swing check. Again, on the discharge of a pump where reverse flow and water hammer can be a problem. And the corresponding pressure spikes that would be generated through the use of a silent check on the discharge of a pump, a uh, silent check or non-slam check valve. Uh, incidentally, uh, there are several terms that refer to a non-slam check valve, silent check, axial flow check valve, some people refer to them as piston checks, nozzle checks, uh, it's, they are all catch-all terms for non-slam check valves. Uh, the piping diagram that you see above, ladies and gentlemen, refers to a real-world application that I'd like to refer to you now. An oil company was experiencing some very severe problems at one of their fuel truck loading stations. Severe vibration and noise were occurring from their uh, lines from the pump to the loading station. The company was concerned about possible damage to the pump and associated equipment. In an attempt to correct the situation, they hired a consultant to examine the system and determine the exact cause of the problems. Uh, 
The installation consisted of a pump here, a discharge swing check valve, approximately 750 feet of piping leading to the loading platforms and a shutoff valve at each platform. To determine exactly what was happening, the consultant attached sensitive pressure trans transducers and a strip recorder to the pump suction, the outlet of the check valve, and the inlet of the shutoff valve. What he documented was the classic water hammer situation shown below. When the truck loading valve was closed, a standing wave develops causing the pressure at the pump discharge to rise from about 150 PSI here to over 600 PSI here in one one hundredth of a second. The pressure spike obviously caused severe stress in the system piping, the pump, and other system components. With an effectively closed system, the pressure spike caused smaller con continued pressure instability for approximately two seconds more. Experience indicated to the consultant that this water hammer occurred due to the use of a swing check valve on the discharge of the pump. A swing check valve closes fairly slowly and allows backflow to occur. When the valve finally closes, the backflow is abruptly stopped, causing extremely rapid pressure buildup, also known as water hammer. The solution was also very easy for the consultant to recognize and recommend, a DFT Excalibur non-slam check valve. Based on the proven successes in the past, the consultant knew that the dual-guided, inline, spring-assisted design of the DFT Excalibur would prevent backflow from occurring. With no backflow, the cause of the water hammer would disappear. The very economical recommendation of an 8-inch Class 150 DFT Excalibur was accepted by the oil company. The valve was in installed and all of the vibration, noise, and system damage was eliminated. Sometime later, the consultant was in the area and decided to document the change in the system. Shown below is a strip chart of the same installation with the readings taken after the installation of the DFT Excalibur non-slam check valve. This shows that the Excalibur not only eliminated the pressure spikes at the pump discharge, it also greatly reduced the pressure changes at the pump suction and at the discharge valve. And again, folks, we're not talking about completely flat curves here, but I think you'll wholeheartedly agree with me that the uh, water hammer was mitigated to the point where it's insignificant. Folks, this is, this is literally one of hundreds of thousands of examples of how DFT non-slam check valves used on the discharge of pumps where reverse flow and water hammer have mitigated pressure surge problems for many, many clients of ours in several different process industries throughout the world. So in summary, history shows that check valves can be, can be the most problematic pipe equipment installed. Designers should consider spending more time in looking at their check valve selection criteria in order to have the most cost-effective and maintenance-free valve installed. Now I'll entertain any questions that you may have. And if you can't think of any questions now that you might like to ask, again, uh, you can see my um, email address featured there. Feel free to email me in the future. And... Um, I can answer your questions at that time. Ah, we have a, uh, um, a question from John Shaver. Uh, the question is, are any of your check valves adequate for use in liquid slurry service, light to heavy slurries? John, that's an excellent question. Obviously, because DFT check valves feature a rather a large flow element right in the line of flow, we have to be very careful. Uh, with applications where there is uh, ingrained solids or indeed any um, any slurry services. So um, obviously you wouldn't want to use a DFT check valve in a like a sewage application where there are lots of rags or other bits of, uh, of stuff going through. Um, however, the DFT check valves will tolerate um, some entrained solids. So my recommendation to you would be to, uh, if you have an application where you're considering using a non-slam check valve on the discharge of the pump in a uh, slurry service, is to get as much detail as you can uh, about the entrained solids and uh, send it to me and I will uh, refer it to the DFT engineering people and they'll be able to get a, give us a, a pretty uh, definitive opinion as to whether they would recommend the use of the valve or not. So I, I hope that answers your question. 
Um, and uh, if it doesn't, then feel free to uh, follow up with me on uh, uh, via email, and uh, we'll make sure that we uh, uh, we get that answer to you. Any other questions, folks? All right. Uh, for potentially future uh, webinars, if anyone has any uh, suggestions for future topics, we would uh, love to hear from you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation in uh, today's webinar, and I wish you all well. Thank you. <laughs>